How's it going out there? It's February 2nd. I think it's just the Wall Street Report podcast. Right back to the headlines and... Uh, tell you what's really moving these markets. Believe it or not, I have another great interview set up today. And it's with Scott Lynn, the founder and CEO of Masterworks. So you heard me mention Masterworks this week. They're sponsoring Wall Street Unplugged. As you know, I don't have a lot of sponsors. Very rarely have sponsors actually on this podcast. Unlike every other podcast in the world. So when I do, it's only for companies I fully support. Companies I use their products or their platforms. Uh, and companies that I trust. But Scott and I go back about two years. I interviewed him on this podcast in, I believe it was 2021. And he just launched his platform like a year earlier that tokenizes contemporary art. And this is art that's usually only available to the ultra wealthy, right? You buy these big art pieces, you put it in the house. But he found a way to bring this to everyday people mom and pop investors to invest in this amazing asset class, right? And he did it by tokenization, which you all should be familiar with, at least, right? That's what we did with Curzio Research. And tokenization is selling a piece of an asset. So investors can have fractional ownership. And why would you do that? Because sometimes a private company or sometimes a real estate, a commercial real estate project, it's, it's an illiquid asset. And when it's a liquid asset, it's hard to basically, you know, your money could be locked up over a certain time. So say if you have uh, a commercial asset and it's worth like $100 million. So now you can sell off $20 million of that to individual investors. Now, individual investors, for the first time, they don't have to own the whole $100 million. But just like a stock, they'll have fractional ownership, participate in how that commercial property does over time. Uh, it's great for the person who's selling it because now you bring in a check, you sell 20%, $20 million right to yourself, which means you're liquid. Now you can use that money to actually build up that real estate portfolio even more, commercial real estate. Uh, it's great for individual investors. Like I say, you, you have a chance to earn commercial or, or to own commercial real estate, a fraction of it for the first time ever, right? It's a great asset. So it checked every single box, which is why we did it, right? And it's just a market that I think is no doubt eventually going to take off. We launched ours in 2018, uh, 19. Very, very early to party. Then we had COVID and a decline. Then we had the whole SPAC revolution and stuff and people loving SPACs. Now you're seeing people get more back into tokenization. So Scott and I have a lot in common where we did this early on. Now, in the case of artwork and what he's doing at Masterworks, uh, I thought this idea was fascinating even back then. So I wasn't surprised when these guys, I think it was October, November 2021, they raised $100 million, gave it a valuation over a billion. And which put them in a class of almost every company that went public via SPAC in 2021, 2022, right? At least in mid by mid 2022. And everybody jumped on the bandwagon. I'm glad that they didn't because you see them come out at crazy valuations and a lot of them have crashed 80, 90%. Uh, a lot of them have seen slower growth. But uh, in Masterworks case, the growth that they've seen even since then has been nothing short of spectacular, right? Which Scott's going to tell you about in a minute. Uh, I like Scott. He's a no-nonsense guy. He's great. He's brilliant. He has a marketing background. Again, he's going to talk about. But I think you got to find the interview fascinating for several reasons. Uh, one is it's giving you access to a new alternative asset class, which is something that outperforms and outperforms the market over a long period of time. But more importantly, it's a great asset or a great place to invest a portion of your money, right? So diversify into when you have crazy markets like the one we're in right now, which we're all seeing, right? It's crazy. Even we know the Fed just came out, they raised, the market was down percent, then it goes up 2%. Okay, just to see the valuations going with the Fed actually maintaining and saying, okay, we're going to continue to raise rates. We're seeing demand fall off a cliff and stocks keep going higher, even though their earnings are going lower. It's a recipe for disaster. The NASDAQ can go up another 15, 20% for me. I have no idea what it's going to do. I just know the shit's going to hit the fan. It's probably going to happen sooner than people think. And when it does, it's not going to be pretty, right? Because it's just the fundamentals aren't there for the market to continue to go high. We all know that. But let's see. The algos are doing what they want to do right now. But it's crazy market. Uh, and this is providing an alternative asset class for you. Just like I talked about crypto. It's like I talked about other different things, right? Uh, and, and the metaverse. So without further ado, here's my interview. Hope you like it. Masterworks founder and CEO, Scott Lynn. Scott, thanks so much for coming back on Wall Street Unplugged. Thanks for having me back. Excited, uh, excited to be here. I guess it's it's been over a year now. 
It has been over a year. And, and let's do a little refresher, right? So you're founder CEO of Masterworks. And why don't you refresh everyone who didn't listen to that past interview, who's not been following you, about Masterworks, the history, how you came up with the idea for tokenizing fine art, which is fantastic. We've done that with our company, tokenizing tokenization as well. Uh, but you know, how did you come up with that idea? Because now you're bringing a sector and an asset class to a market that never really had access to it, right? With individual investors. Uh, explain how you just came up with, with this idea. Yeah, it's good. It's a good question. So Masterworks now is, uh, I guess we're, we're four and a half years old. Uh, we have 700,000 investors on the platform. We have nearly a billion dollars in AUM. Um, the idea really started, I mean, I, I've been starting technology companies for 20 years now and I've also been collecting art along the way. Um, so I've, I've seen the value of my own collection grow and the genesis of, of the idea behind Masterworks is really taking a look at my own personal art collection and saying, hey, how can I securitize this and make this asset class available to anyone who wants to invest in it? The, the really interesting thing about the art market and contemporary art just broadly is that the most investable segment of the art market are really paintings above a million dollars. And those, those tend to be the, the artworks that have the most predictable appreciation rates. So interestingly, the asset class inherently, uh, historically, has only been available to those who have enough money to buy those paintings, which obviously is very, very few people. So our view is that it should be an asset class that is securitized and made available to anyone who wants to, to invest in, in these works of art. So art has normally been a recession-proof market, I think it's fair to say. Uh, I was, uh, you bring up the fact that last 26 years it performed tons of asset classes, right? When it comes to real estate, stock market, and things like that. Uh, how have you performed over the last year and a half, right? When we had market conditions, you know, just challenging market conditions, challenging market conditions go going into the future. But it seems like with the numbers that you just gave me, a billion dollars in your platform, 700,000 people, that uh, things are going well and you guys are still growing. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're definitely still growing. So last year, our AUM doubled. I think our user count, our user count doubled. Now, there's there's no question that um, I think performance of of art overall has softened. I think the question is how how much is it softened? So if you look at our performance specifically last year on a gross basis, our portfolio uh, was up about seven point eight percent. And in context with with prior years, that that's actually way down. So we. You know, in prior years, our, our portfolio has been up uh, more than twenty percent on a gross basis. So, uh, definitely a down year, but but compared to really any other asset class, it's still incredible. I think um, you know that performance is second only to uh, to energy last year. Um, so, you know, we feel we feel really good about it. I, I, I think I think art has performed. If you look at data from like the late seventies and into the early eighties, um, in prior inflationary times, art has performed. Really well during those periods. Um, today, obviously, is is kind of a new animal, and there's there's lots of different complexities of trying to figure out the, the global economy in today's world. But but uh, the portfolio is still still holding up pretty well. So I remember last time we spoke. This is October 2021, I believe, and you just raised money, right? Put your uh, I think it was over a little bit over 100 million dollars. Put your valuation over a billion. Uh, congratulations, by the way, which is fantastic. Uh, <laughs> and I remember you saying that the average investor puts uh, around five thousand dollars in initially, and then thirty thousand over the lifetime. Have those numbers changed? Have you seen more demand from that asset class, or are you seeing, you know, maybe some of the ultra wealthy, right, who goes to Christie's and Sotheby's and things like that, start using your platform and saying, "Hey, this might be a better idea than going just straight to auction." Yeah, we, we don't really see that. So our, our typical investor is not an art world person. Our typical investor is definitely uh, someone who knows knows close to nothing about art, is looking to learn about the asset class for the first time, uh, is looking to generate a, generate non correlated returns as part of their overall portfolio. They're they're really just a uh, you know a typical a typical investor looking at an alternative asset class. So that that is still our bread and butter investor today. I think if our, our number was. Five thousand dollars a year and a half ago. It's it's roughly six thousand dollars today. So maybe that's that's come up slightly. Um, but yeah, I mean, we we encourage investors to get started at a very small allocation of their portfolio, and then to grow over time. And almost always, we see investors starting out at at a very small number, and then growing um, on a monthly, quarterly basis after that. 
So talk about how the platform works because I know that and when I'm looking at it here, you know, you have a great learning center. Uh, you probably get lots of questions and things like that. But talk a little bit how this works. So I want to uh, buy a painting that's selling, say, for a million dollars. And, I, you know, it's fractional ownership. I'm going to buy a small piece of it. Uh, what happens when it's sold? Uh, how do you monitor how it's appreciating? Is it appreciating where people are willing to pay more for that, just like a stock, right? You're selling off a piece of a stock and, and, and it's a fractional ownership. Yeah, how does that whole market work behind the scenes for someone that that's looking to do this and, and invest for the first time? Yeah, so maybe let, let, let's start really high level and think about um, kind of just our process and how we find paintings that we think are investable in the art market. So we have, Messworks has about 215 employees now. We have a research team of 14 people. And that research team is primarily responsible for understanding what segments of the art market do we think are most investable. So we look at a whole bunch of data around how different artist markets <clears throat> are performing, how, how different segments of the art market are trending. And we basically come up with certain artist markets or certain sub-segments of those markets that we think are most investable. So our research team identifies those segments and then, and then basically hands that off to our acquisitions team, which is a team of another dozen people roughly who, who then go into those artist markets and basically source work today from over 2,000 intermediaries. So we're offered now as the biggest buyer in the art market, we're offered I think six, $700 million in art a month. Um, so really an incredible volume of art. And then we're buying a, a small fraction of that. Um, so that's that's kind of the investment process in terms of deciding what paintings do we buy. Once we purchase the painting, we file, um, we, we put it into a Delaware LLC and we file that with the SEC as a registered public, public offering. Once the SEC qualifies the offering, we sell shares in the painting, investors buy those shares. And then after the offering closes, the painting starts trading on our secondary market. So just like you can buy shares in Google and then trade shares in Google, you can buy shares in an individual painting and then trade shares in an individual painting. Um, eventually, the painting will, will be sold. And when the painting is sold, those proceeds are distributed to shareholders. So that's, that's the very high-level concept of the, of the business and how it works. That's amazing because it, for me, that creates a high barrier of entry, right? I mean, it's going to the SEC, making sure there's security, which leads to my next question because it seems the hardest part is getting the platform set, getting the trading, everything done, right? Now you have data analytics behind it with art, but is it just art? Because I notice on your site, when you go into the learning sector, you also have crypto and NFTs. I'm not too sure if you're selling NFTs or cryptos, but the fact that you're going to <laughs> the SEC might just answer my question there, bud. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That, so that, that learning center is just kind of like very broad content on, on anything related to art and investing. Um, but but yeah, we we are strictly focused on our, we, we don't do anything crypto. We often get the question of how do we think about classic cars? How do we think about trading cards. Um, you know, the reality is like my background is in art, our, our senior team's background really is in art. I think at the end of the day, these asset classes are very complicated, mm -hmm. very hard to understand. Um, the, the art market's incredibly complex on its own. So I don't mm -hmm. really see us ever going into um, other asset classes. So how do you achieve the growth rate? I think it's, I think you said it's a $1.7 uh, billion market. So you know, a lot of people will branch out. Uber now is Uber Eats, Uber everything, right? So, how would you branch out? Because what I do see with NFTs, and again, it's very hard, especially when you're going to the SEC to register these paintings as security. Uh, with that said, Open Seas was doing a billion a month. They're still doing on a low end, two hundred, three hundred million dollars a month. It seems like you know the younger market right there it might be the demographic. But how do you achieve growth? Is it just taking more of that total addressable market and, and more marketing like you're doing, and just get more people to the platform? Uh, because, you know, obviously to increase that total addressable market sometimes, maybe you have to venture out of paintings. Yeah. So, so, uh, so the, the market, the total asset class size is 1.7 trillion, not, not 1.7 billion. <laughs> um, so it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, a it's, long, it's slightly, slightly, slightly <laughs> different, but yeah, so it's a huge market, right? So it's, it's estimated that roughly $60 billion in art sells every year. Uh, half of that is a public auction. So you have you have a you know you have a huge um, transaction volume in the asset class overall. So I think from our perspective, to go from one billion in AUM to two billion, two billion to four billion um, is is not that hard. So that that's really just what we're focused on at the moment. And the assets of the management, for my curiosity, because I'm fascinated by this. So the assets of the management is that actually in some of the artwork, or some people may sell it 
leave the money there and, and wait for something else to, to, to come along? And is it kind of like a money market account or how does that whole situation work? Because that's very interesting to me. Yeah, so we, we we do have we do have money we do have like a money market account account equivalent so you can open a masterworks wallet and keep cash in the wallet but our AUM numbers are just just for the art specifically. Oh, cool, cool. So AI data analytics. I mean, ChatGPT now is 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 massive and, and now it's mainstream. It's everywhere. But uh, are you using these things? Because you said I was surprised to see how big your research team is. Where it looks like you really do your due diligence on the paintings that that are best to put in front of your audience, if that's uh, right to say, uh, where they had the most price appreciation potential. Uh, is there a lot of data analytics behind that AI or is it just, hey, we're hiring experts that really know their stuff within uh, this industry? Yeah, you know, I think the problems in the art world are slightly different than problems in other other industries. So the challenge with the art world, um, frankly, is that it's, it's operated the same way for centuries. So if you look at Sotheby's, which is one of the top two auction houses, Sotheby's is 275 years old. It was the oldest company on the uh, the New York Stock Exchange before before going private a couple of years ago. So I mean th this industry has literally been around for centuries and from a data perspective there's there's never really been a great um, clean data set that you can easily access to understand um, what prices paintings have sold for historically, et cetera. So part of our problem separate from our research team is that we have a large data collection team um, of one to two dozen people that are just manually collecting data on different things in the art market all the time, so our research team can actually analyze it. But when it comes to to AI, um, you know, we use basic machine learning models within our research team to try to predict where our art prices are going for each of these artist markets uh, in conjunction with with those data sets. But you know, we're still we're still in the early innings of of doing that with with this as, asset class. When I conduct interviews, which I've done for 15, 15 years, uh, I always go back and find out as much information as possible because I like to do my homework, right? Uh, and I noticed that the marketing background, I think we might have talked about this last time I interviewed you. How important was that to establish this company? Because at the end of the day, you could have the greatest idea, but if you're not marketed correctly, uh, and tokenization, again, something that we've done with our, one of the few ever uh, where we sold off a piece of our company and people could buy shares in it and they actually have an actual equity ownership in our business. Uh, but that's not the easiest story to tell everyone. Uh, how are you able to tell this story where I see you guys everywhere? I see you guys advertising. I see people talking about it, even social media, not from you, through your advertisers. People are talking about your work. How much did your marketing background help with that? Because again, tokenization is not the easiest story to tell everybody. <laughs> I think I mean look I think that's a really great question I think it's a uh, it's a very hard problem because I, I tend to I tend to take marketing problems and break them down into two different categories one is one is um, sort of, of of marketing problems where there's pre-existing intent and that's a typical easy marketing problem right like if I'm selling shoes there's pre-existing intent for people to buy shoes I can go to Google and I can buy the keyword. Um, you know, some type of shoe and like, that's an easy marketing problem to solve. The hard marketing problems to solve are, are marketing problems where there's no intent, where you have to build intent. And the reality is today for Masterworks, 99.9% .9 of people do not know that they can invest in art. They don't know how to invest in art. They don't know how it works. Um, so we're really telling that story for the first time. So I think you're right. I mean, I think these businesses uh, early on are, are largely marketing problems, um, so so my background in marketing has been been really helpful with that. But it's it's still a challenge every every day. No, I appreciate you sharing that. Right, it's always a challenge with marketing, no matter how good you are at it. I think right, you could always feel like you can market better. It's kind of like golf, right? If you shoot a fifty nine, you're going to shoot a fifty eight, <laughs> <laughs> right? Just, there's no perfection. Right? It's just like killing you. It's like the only sport I know where the better you get, the more angry you get at yourself. So uh, yeah, marketing like, marketing's the same way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hear you. I hear you. So. Uh, what's the next step for you? Uh, I'm very, very happy because again, I follow you guys. Uh, we've interviewed each other. I've interviewed you, uh, you know, a while ago, over a year ago. Uh, and we saw the whole SPAC revolution, right? So you raise money, you have investors in there. I mean, what are the intentions? Cause you have a platform that's growing. That makes sense. That's in the right areas. Uh, I would expect it. And I'm glad you didn't do the SPAC because the way they set up SPACs, uh, you could see why they're all getting crushed with the valuations. They come out. It's all fun and games until, you know, you have a week of market and, and even the good names, right? Ha have come down tremendously. Uh, but what are your plans? I mean, your valuation, I would think it probably came down like everybody else's a little bit, you know, in, in the whole market and private markets. But 
What are your plans? Because I could see this being uh, a publicly traded company, a publicly traded platform, uh, and you have the revenue, you have the users, you have the growth there. Seems like it checks off all the boxes, but what are the plans? What's the end goal? Yeah, I mean, I think I think as a you know as a founder CEO, you always have to think about what the exit is. I think for us, the 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 obvious exit is at some point to take the business the business public. I still think we're we're far away from that today. Um, you know, if I think about the opportunity, really high level, it's just that when you look at art as an asset class historically, it's outperformed public equities. It has a low correlation to other asset classes. It deserves a role in every investor's portfolio in some way, some way shape, or form. But there's never there's never been a way to invest in it. And one of the the, the good things, I guess, about all of the macro dynamics, I was I was telling this to the company at the beginning of the year, is that when we look back at the seven hundred thousand investors who have signed up on the platform uh, over the past whatever three plus years. You know, it, it feels really good to know that many of those people that invested in art over the past couple of years have done much better than if they would have invested in public equities. Mm. So I think we we really are creating value for investors on a daily basis. And I think I think we're just in the very early innings of that, right? Like we we just want to take this asset class, which performs better than most and has really good uh, characteristics and make it make it investable for for everyone. It's also a tough compare with today's society where people want to get rich tomorrow, the equity markets, how volatile they are, right? Social media and everything. So uh, when it comes to even marketing, it might be like, but what is, is, I don't want to say the most expensive piece, but probably the best piece that you sold where I think that would drive so much traffic where, hey, this is on a platform right now. You could own a piece of this, right? What was one of those pieces where you're like, wow, this is great. This is on a platform right now, maybe over the past six months to a year. Yeah, I mean, we, you know, there, there's there's been so many artist markets that that have done well over the past two or three years. Um, I, I think it's everything from, I mean, the Banksy market has has really been on fire the past couple of years. Um, you know, that has slowed recently, but there's an artist named Barkley Hendrix. Um, this market's up 300 percent plus. But I, you know, if you, if you take a step back, I think the the important thing to understand about art is that in general, most of these artist markets do not accelerate incredibly rapidly, right? Like most of them are sort of stable, predictable markets. The Basquiat market's a great example of that, which is appreciated anywhere between 16 and 18% for the past 25 years. Um, that's kind of a, a, a stable, you know, more stable, overperforming artist market. Um, so that's the great thing about the asset class is you can find some of these artist markets, which sort of uh, predictably appreciate without taking too much risk, but it's definitely not like NFTs or crypto where you know you're going to make 100 percent in a year, but you could also lose 50 percent of your money. It's 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 not that sort of asset class. No. So next steps where going public maybe in, in the future you want to be able to grow a little more, uh, which is great. But just to see how far you've come is pretty remarkable, Scott. Seriously, I'm not saying that. I'm not you know just you know trying to catch your ass or anything. But it is remarkable because, again, it's an industry I truly believe in. This is what we do at our company when it comes to tokenization. To see how far you've taken it, uh, there's not like this hype around like crypto or things like that. I mean, it, it's a real company. It's growing. People that use your service all love it. Uh, it's just pretty fascinating to see how far you've come. And I'm looking forward to see the next steps over the next year or two. So uh, with that said, if someone wants to learn more, obviously, they can go to masterworks.com get in touch with you, but any other ways in social media platforms or anything else? Because I'm sure when people listen to this, they're going to be uh, definitely interested in learning more about your company. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the best way to learn more about the company and really to learn more about the asset class is to go to masterworks.com, um, request access to the platform. <laughs> I see you've got an account there. Request access to the platform. Um, schedule a call with one of our financial advisors. We have a team of 40, 50 financial advisors that literally just onboard investors all day long. And they, they ask about portfolio size, risk tolerance, how you're investing today, and then they help you think through um, how art can play a role in your your investment objectives and what you're trying to achieve. So I think that's really the, the best place to start. And then uh, always feel free to reach out to me if there's there's any questions. So request invitation and then somebody actually gets on the phone with you. Yeah. So we're, we're big believers in that because I think most people with this asset class are unfamiliar with it. They don't know how to think about it. They don't know how to think about an allocation to art as part of their overall portfolio. They're not sure how to think about uh, diversification within art. Um, so we really believe in having financial advisors talk to 
uh, individual investors and, and act as fiduciaries to help them think through some of those those um, very very specific things around around risk and allocation and um, how they, they should think about investing for the first time. No, nah, it's great stuff. Well, Scott, listen, I, I, I so happy for your success, seeing you grow over a couple of years, uh, and, and and I know it's going to continue to happen over the next few years. So hopefully, you join us again. And thank you so much for uh, coming on Wall Street and Plug. Really appreciate it, man. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Great stuff from Scott. We feel like I have close ties with him in the tokenization world, right? Early to the party, told you at CES. Had a big setup with a stage and separate companies all talking about tokenization. I'm walking by going, ah, I did it like two, three years ago, guys. You know, it was pretty cool. Uh, and Scott did as well. So I love what he's doing at Masterworks. I had no idea that he was registering every art piece with the SEC. Uh, makes sense, right? It's considered a security that people buy and sell and host make a profit on. That sounds familiar. It's the exact definition for 99% of all the altcoins or the shit coins that trade on numerous crypto exchanges, which the SEC has yet to provide the regulatory framework for trading cryptos. And this includes launching Bitcoin ETFs. Why don't we have Bitcoin ETFs? What's the problem here? Why don't we have that? We have future markets and products for Bitcoin in, for futures. Why not? Why? Why are they dragging their feet on this? It's amazing. But definitely check out the platform. Let me know what you think. And we ended that conversation where he was talking about NFTs. And I said, look, NFTs, it's a massive market for him. A massive market for him. And I know you know a lot of stuff has to get registered. But yeah, you know, I have close ties to that industry now. It took me a long time to, to, to build. There's a lot of bullshit in the industry, just like crypto. And the NFT projects uh, that uh, I'm coming across are, are amazing. So you know, I, I shared contacts and said, listen, these are the guys that I trust that I built, uh, you know, relationships with. It took me a while and, you know, traveling a lot and going crazy and, and, you know, I'm getting old these days at 50, but that's why you have to be in the room for these things, right? It's very important, uh, to build those relationships. And he was interested in that. He's like, yeah, I just don't know anything about NFTs. I want to learn more about it. I said, you know, me too. You know, I know about NFTs, but holy cow, you know, for me, I want to make sure that once we launch it, we're going to launch a newsletter about it provide great, great services throughout that industry with, with people who are experts uh, that I've learned from where the, my biggest thing is, you know, I don't want to, anyone to get scammed and people get scammed a lot in this industry. You need to learn. There's a learning curve there. But when you explain it to people, you could see how NFTs are the future. It's the future of the platform. And man, Masterworks will see incredible, incredible growth. The hardest part is getting that platform up and running, trading platform, SEC and stuff like that. You have that. Now it's just throwing more and more stuff on that platform, and, and I think it's a good idea, and we'll see. Maybe we'll work together in the future. But uh, uh, for that interview and, and Master, I, I love bringing new ideas, right? Uh, alternative asset classes to you, especially during volatile markets like you know, what we see, right, this week. Not, not even this week, but if you look at the NASDAQ, right? Crashed 35% a few months ago, only the surge. But over 10% in January, it's up another 3% in February already after the Fed meeting. And amazes me. I mean, the Fed is there. We said they said they're going to continue to raise rates. I mean, mentioned the word disinflation, a couple of positives here and there, but still, you know, going to continue to raise rates. They're not going to lower anytime soon. Inflation is still stubbornly high in many areas, but this volatility is going to continue through 2023, well into 2024, uh, with the Fed doing everything in its power to force a recession, make sure that unemployment rises to help slow inflation. But uh, this alternative asset class is pretty cool for anyone. And that's my job, to try to bring you ideas, new ideas, expand the horizon there with crypto, NFTs, everything. Whatever I feel that I'm investing in or you can make money on, I'm going to bring to you. So I say this all the time. This is about you, not about me. So let me know what you thought at frankcurseyresearch.com. That's frank at cursyresearch.com. And that's it for me. But before I go, before I go, I have a special surprise for you. I will have another interview for you on Friday. Okay, I do my Frankly Speaking podcast, which is available to paid subscribers only. Yeah, you just got to subscribe to any one of our services, even the cheapest one, and you get Frankly This isn't Frankly Speaking. This is a special interview. It's a great guest who has one of the deepest networks in terms of celebrities, professional athletes, influencers, CEOs, than anyone I know. It's saying a lot. And this person's going to actually interview me on Saturday during a live stream for the Celebrity All-Star Basketball Game at the Thomas Mac Arena in Vegas on Saturday. There's going to be tons of superstars there. He invited me there. I cannot go because I'm actually going to be moving a lot of my stuff out of my house that day. Uh, and then you get the Super Bowl next week with my daughter's birthday on it. So I, it was just too difficult for me to get back to Vegas and go across the country. But Floyd Mayweather is going to be there. Uh, Gary Payton, Dennis Rodman, Eric Dickerson, uh, Michael Vick, 
Debo Samuel, Stefan Diggs, a whole bunch of people. Uh, and and Frank Curzio. Oh my God. <laughs> so uh it's just being in the right circles. You know, and you're gonna see how I met this person just, you know, out of nowhere. And next thing I know, I'm like, wow, this guy's pretty cool. I like him a lot. I think you're gonna like this interview. It's really, really cool. And special interview where I'll also be making a super special announcement about Wall Street Unplugged, which I know you're going to love. It's something that we've been building for the past few months. Some of our subscribers got emails already about it. Uh, I'm very excited, uh, but I'm going to make the major announcement during that interview or right after that interview, uh, which is going to take place on Friday. So be sure to have your iTunes set to automatic download for Wall Street Unplugged. So once we publish this podcast on Friday, it's going to automatically alert you, or maybe you're like, hey, Frank doesn't publish ever on Friday, other than frankly speaking. Again, that's a different service. It's not on iTunes. This is going to go on iTunes. I'm going to send it to you again with the special announcement. Special interview. Really, really cool. Added value to you because I love you guys, but it's a must listen. And yeah, just love providing value for you guys. Let me know what you thought about everything. Seriously. FrankCurzonResearch.com. I'm here for you. That's it for me. And I'll see everyone, not just my paid subscribers, for frankly speaking, but I'll see everyone tomorrow. Take care. <laughs>